Welcome to the workshop, CAR-T Cell Therapy, Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia, A Drive Through the Past, Present, and Future. My name is Michaela O'Brien, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Kite, a Gilead company, whose support helped make this workshop possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Hanin Shalabi. Dr. Shalabi is an assistant research physician in the Pediatric Oncology Branch of the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Her clinical focus is on the treatment relapsed refractory pediatric patients with blood cancers using CAR-T cell therapy. Dr. Shalabi is also interested in the neurocognitive effects of immunotherapies in pediatric patients and bone marrow transplantation for patients with malignant and non-malignant diseases. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shalabi. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's my honor to be here celebrating a Second Chance at Life Survivorship Symposium. My name is Hanin Shalabi, and I will be presenting on CAR T cell therapy in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The learning objectives over the next hour include to discuss why people may need CAR T cell therapy for leukemia, talk about steps involved in making a CAR T-cell product, share some of the short and long-term side effects that we have associated with CAR T-cell therapy, and review outcomes after CAR T-cell therapy. To start, I wanted to kind of take us back to, you know, how blood cells grow. And so blood cells grow in the bone marrow um, and so on the screen here, you see uh, a pictorial image of a long bone. And in that long bone, inside the medulla of the long bone or in the bone marrow space, these baby blood stem cells have the ability to give birth to or differentiate or make themselves into more mature blood cells of varying degrees. And so you can see here that from that stem cell, several additional cells become born after that. And so I would like to focus on the lymphoid stem cell process. And you see that lymphoblasts are present um, at one of the steps. And then from those lymphoblasts, there are additional cells that continue to be born. One is a B lymphoblast or a lymphocyte. And the other one is a T lymphocyte. And those are the two that I would like to focus primarily on. So the T lymphocytes are the cells that are used to make CAR T cells. And from that lymphoblast that is one stage above the lymphocytes, the lymphoblast stage is where leukemia cells um, can actually occur. And so in general, leukemia is thought to occur when the lymphoblast acquires changes in the genetic material of that cell. And so the, the cell's DNA contains special instructions that tell cells what to do. And when those instructions become altered or changed, that's when cells can sometimes become um, imbalanced and can continue to grow and proliferate, thereby causing leukemia. Childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in children. We have about 30 cases per million in children aged less than 20 here in the United States, and it accounts for approximately 25% of all new pediatric cancer diagnoses. With that said, 85 to 90% of patients will be cured with standard of care chemotherapy. As you see here in this survival plot that um, Charles Mulligan had published back in 2015, you can see that over the course of the years, our ability to increase survival in patients has improved quite substantially. So each of these lines represents a study era or a decade um, in which we were learning about leukemia and varying ways to treat pediatric leukemia. And as you see, the lines go up, this 
denotes the years. So this starts in 1968, and then it ends in the 2006 to 2009 era. And we do a really good job um, in terms of uh, improved survival, and that is um, based on decades of research and how we should treat our patients. And so certain things that have changed in the pediatric leukemia space include utilizing um, multi-drugged um, chemotherapy that attack cancer cells from different targets in different ways, um, giving um, intrathecal chemotherapies to prevent leukemia from going to the central nervous system. Um, and so as you can see, based on the research that's been done in the decades previous, survival for pediatric leukemia patients um, has improved. ALL in adults is a more rare diagnosis. However, it is the second most commonly diagnosed acute leukemia in adults. There are approximately 6,500 cases per year in the United States. However, only 40 to 50% of adults that are diagnosed with ALL will achieve long-term durable remissions. So when a pediatric patient is diagnosed um, with leukemia, they receive chemotherapy for approximately 2.5 years or two and a half years. And this is done in varying phases. Um, the first phase usually lasts a month. It involves more intense chemotherapy. And then um, depending on how the response is to that first month of therapy, our patients will go on to receive additional months of therapy in varying degrees of intensity, meaning some months will be more intense and require hospitalization and some months will be less intense where patients could receive therapy as outpatients. And then in the final um, year and a half of therapy, it is called maintenance therapy, whereby patients are outpatient primarily and receiving lower doses of chemotherapy um, to maintain remissions. For standard of care treatment in adults, um, patients receive chemotherapy for several months um, that could be um, you know, intensified or um, more or less outpatient regimen after the first month if they achieve a complete remission, meaning their leukemia has gone away. And for both pediatric and adult ALL patients, bone marrow transplants could be considered after a patient achieves a remission for patients that have high uh, risk features of their leukemia. And that can be uh, based on what genetics the leukemia looks like, which is normally um, performed within the first month of diagnosis. Recently, immunotherapy has moved into more upfront settings in both pediatrics and adults with leukemia. And so Blin Cyto is a bispecific T cell engager. Its job is to target CD19 cells, which all leukemia has when it starts. And another immunotherapy um, called inatuzumab or basfanza um, targets the CD22 protein on leukemia cells. And this has been moved into more upfront settings in both pediatric and adults. Now, you know, going into patients that um, unfortunately relapse after standard of care treatments, um, we really have to take a step back and, and try to think about each patient individually and look at what types of therapies they've received in the past and potentially what their side effect profile has been. And so, you know, in the era of immunotherapy, I think we have an opportunity here to really um, think thoughtfully about what toxicities patients have experienced in the past and hopefully give them a type of therapy that is new to their disease that could help them achieve a remission um, that they may not have seen before. And so when we have patients that are relapsed or refractory, the, there is a therapeutic challenge because we have to take into account how much chemotherapy has impacted organs such as cardiac function or your heart, your kidneys, and your liver, and this may limit 
treatment options moving forward. So that really put us um, into thinking about how we can create novel treatments for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in both the pediatric and adult setting. Chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy is what the remainder of the talk will focus on, and this will specifically be with regards to ALL. So going back to the blood cells and how blood cells are made, we have we all have normal, healthy T cells, and those are cells that our body has in order to help us fight infection, help us fight foreign objects that have presented into our body, whether it be infection, um, cancer. And so normally, T cells cannot recognize cancer cells. Um, so what the chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR T cell therapy does, is that it re-engineers the T cells utilized from a patient's own body so that the T cell can then recognize the cancer cell. So really the goal is for our therapy to modify the patient's own T cells, so really taking their immune system and changing the T cells so that they can be redirected against a leukemia cell. And so in this image here, you see that the blue circle is um, a schematic image of a leukemia blast. And for example, all leukemias present with CD19, which is a protein, on the surface of the leukemia cell. And in the gray, you see this is a CAR T cell. So the gray area would be a patient's own T cell that we take out um, through a process called apheresis, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And with those T cells, we are able to, um, in the lab, introduce uh, a vector which changes how the T cell functions in that it allows the T cell to go in and recognize an antigen that it potentially wouldn't have been able to recognize before. So in this um, picture, you can see that this area right here in the long gray with the two um, triangles on top, this would be the car that's inserted into a patient's T cell. And so when this T cell or CAR T cell is infused, it really goes in and it has ability to recognize this diamond-shaped CD19. It would bind to the CD19 and then allow for the patient's own T cell to bind to and destroy the leukemia cell. So making a CAR T cell product involves several steps, the first of which is apheresis. So apheresis includes um, either placing two large IVs peripherally, so in, into your elbow or um, your, your arms, um, or putting in a temporary line that is a large uh, IV so that we can remove a patient's um, blood the, there's a machine, the apheresis machine, which is pictorially demonstrated here, that spins the blood around and that we would extract the white blood cells, including T cells. And then the second IV would then give the patient back their hemoglobin and platelets. And so in the bag that's collected, um, we then would remove the T cells to use that to make the actual treatment or the CAR T cell product. In the lab, as you can see on the screen, steps two, three, and four occur. And so the T cells are depicted here in the greenish blue color, and the actual CAR or the chimeric antigen receptor is also put into the same media with other stimulation so that the CAR T cells can interact, they can actually express themselves on the outside of the T cell, and then also expand. And so when we talk about cells expanding in the lab, we're really trying to make doses for patients so that they could receive the appropriate dose um, based on the trial. And so all the second, third, and fourth steps occur in the lab. 
after that, while the cells um, are growing or after they've completed growing and there is a dose available to the patient, patients then receive lymphodepleting chemotherapy, and this could differ based on trial, although most trials utilize fludarabine and cyclophosphamide uh, as lymphodepleting regimens, meaning chemotherapy that they give before the CAR T cells to prepare the body to accept the CAR T cells and create a nice um, home for them so that there's enough food and nutrients for the CAR T cells to grow. And then finally, step six is um, patients receiving the CAR T cell infusion, which based on um, the center in which you're receiving it could be done as either an inpatient or an outpatient. So who gets CAR T cells in leukemia? So typically the way that the FDA approved products um, are now and what the indication for is that CAR T cell therapy is given for patients who have relapsed, meaning their leukemia has come back, or in patients that have refractory ALL, meaning their leukemia has not responded to chemotherapy and it is in fact never responded to chemotherapy. Um, after either chemotherapy and or transplant. So there are two FDA-approved uh, CAR T-cell products um, for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. One of them is tisagen leclusil, which is a CAR T-cell product that is approved in the pediatric leukemia setting for patients less than 25 years of age, and that was approved back in 2017. And then more recently, a new product called Brexocaptogene Autolucil, or Ticardis, uh, received FDA approval in the adult setting in 2021. And that is an indication for patients that are greater than 18 years of age. The approval of these two products really came from clinical trial work um, that has been done in the community. And so this is a study or a trial that was performed globally looking at um, TISA cell or TISAGEN leclusol, and it demonstrated remarkable response rates in pediatric patients that had relapsed or refractory BALL. And so 25 centers across the world participated in this trial. The initial trial reported on 75 patients that were infused, and they had remarkable responses with over 80% of those patients achieving complete remission, meaning their leukemia went away completely. This plot here demonstrates um, the event-free survival, meaning patients were able to remain in remission. Um, and so when you look at this um, Plot. You can look down here at the months. So at 12 months, the event-free survival was approximately 50%. And what that means is that 50% of patients um, that re received these cells that had an initial remission were still in a remission at the one-year time point. And so um, this is excellent news in this field because these are patients that had severely refractory leukemia, so either it had come back after a chemotherapy or a transplant, or they had refractory disease that had never gone away. And so in this era, you know, and in this specific patient population, having a, you know, a 50% event-free survival rate at 50% is remarkable, although obviously there is room for improvement because we want all patients to survive and to have their leukemia stay in remission. Also to note, this gray line is the overall survival, meaning um, that patients were monitored for several years after they were uh, received CAR T cells, and 75% of patients um, had survived at that one year time point. This next slide refers to the adult trial that led to the FDA approval of Bruxacel. Um, and this study really demonstrated that um, this CAR T cell product 
was effective at treating adult patients with BALL. So this additionally was a multi-site study that occurred in the United States um, that was done over 19 hospitals and they reported on 45 patients who received CAR T cells for relapsed refractory B cell ALL, and also demonstrated that almost 70% of the patients that received these CAR T cells achieved complete remission rates. What they had found was that the median duration or the duration of remission for a half of the patients evaluated was approximately seven months. This graph is taken from the study and demonstrates a patient's best overall response, and um, this is the percentage of patients. And as you can see here, again, you had uh, about 70% of patients achieving complete remissions, which is denoted here in the CR. Um, we had one patient, or four, sorry, 4% 4 of patients achieving blast-free or having their leukemia gone. However, they didn't have cells evaluable in the bone marrow. You had some patients achieving partial remission, and then um, unfortunately some patients having no response. So how do patients get to CAR T cells? So the process of receiving CAR T cells for treatment of relapsed refractory ALL um, can be quite long. And so um, you need to have insurance approval for one of the FDA-approved products, which could take about two to three weeks. Um, you would need to be referred to a CAR T cell center. At this point in time, I think this is less of a problem, although it's, access still remains a problem if you ha live in a more remote area. Um, but there are several centers now that have access to FDA-approved products and who have the experience um, needed to administer these products and, and do the collection and, you know, send the cells out for manufacturing. Um, and so the referral, if, you're, if your home hospital doesn't do CAR T cells, would have to go through, you know, a referral to a CAR T cell center. The apheresis is the T cell collection. This is usually done in a one-day time period potentially done in a two-day time period if a patient's blood counts are really low. Um, however, once the T cells are collected, they then need to be shipped to the central place where CAR T cells are made or manufactured, and that could take two to three weeks for the cells to actually grow depending on you know, what type of product or what type of CAR T cell you would be receiving. The chemotherapy that is given before CAR T cells is usually given four to five days before. Then patients usually have a rest day followed by the CAR T cell infusion. And then we monitor our patients extremely closely for side effects and toxicities um, for the first month. And then depending on what the patient's response is, at the end of that month, um, we would follow the patients up, uh, you know, in different intervals. There are several treatment options in the CAR T cell um, space for non-FDA approved CAR T cell products. So there are several clinical trials for pediatric and adult patients with relapsed or refractory ALL and a great website to go and look at if you're looking into whether or not CAR T cells could be an option for you would be clinicaltrials.gov. This is updated um, regularly to demonstrate what trials are available um, and you know, what the actual trials um, and eligibility criteria would be. Typically, these trials for you know, non-FDA approved CARs are either phase one, meaning it's the first time that this study is being done, and so we're really looking at, one, what the side effect profile is, and two, trying to find the appropriate dose for the CAR T cell product that's being studied. And then phase two trials, which are generally done after phase one trials, so phase one would determine what dose would be appropriate, so phase two would look at that dose and use it in a larger um, patient group. 
so that we could continue to look at the side effect profile. And then also, and I think what's most important to patients and their families is, does it work? And so phase two and phase three trials really look to see how this you know, product would work in a larger patient population in terms of does it get rid of leukemia and what side effects do patients encounter? And then I think the last thing I'd like to note on this slide is that the eligibility process and criteria really differs depending on what trial. And so I think it's very important to have collaboration with your home doctors so that they can look at all of the trials available and determine which one a patient may be eligible for and then reach out to the team that is running the clinical trial. During the process of making the CAR T cells, which could be between two and three weeks, you may receive chemotherapy at either your home institution or the hospital that you were referred to for CAR T cells. And it's really um, for one of two reasons. One is either to keep the leukemia disease controlled, maybe you have low burden disease or low leukemia in your bone marrow, um, and we want to, to keep it that way. Um, or two, you may be um, given more chemotherapy in order to try to decrease the amount of leukemia you have in your bone marrow, depending on how much you have. Because recent studies are coming out to demonstrate that patients that have a high leukemia burden in their bone marrow before receiving CAR cells could have more severe side effects. And also, if they have high burden of disease in their bone marrow, those patients have been shown to have lower chances of getting into remission with CAR T cell therapy. So during the, you know, the CAR T cell therapy, um, as I stated, about five days prior to the infusion, lower doses of chemotherapy, typically with two drugs called fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, are given in order to prepare your body to receive the cells, to create space for CAR T cells to grow so that they could use cytokines or the vitamins and nutrition that your body innately makes or makes on its own so that these cells can grow. And then also we try to give it to keep the disease under control while the CAR T cells are growing in your body. On day zero, the CAR T cell infusion is done. And as I said, it could be given in or outpatient depending on the center. And then typically side effects are monitored very closely over the first month after infusion. So moving along to some of the most common side effects, cytokine release syndrome, or CRS, is the most common side effect from CAR T cell therapy, and it could really involve every part of your body. And so I like to think about it as more of a generalized side effect um, and think about it in terms of head to toe. And so it is a syndrome or a constellation of symptoms, so a group of symptoms that are caused because your body is producing higher than normal cytokines or inflammation markers in your body. Over 80% of patients that receive CAR T cells will get CRS. And the onset of cytokine release syndrome is within hours to days after the infusion. The most common symptoms of CRS include fever, low blood pressure, and difficulty breathing or shortness of breath. But as I said, and just sort of looking at the image on the screen, it really could affect multiple areas of a patient's body, including the lungs, heart, the kidneys, the liver, uh, your blood counts, stomach and your intestines, muscles, bones, and then your neurologic system, which are brain and nerves. So as these products, these CAR T cell treatments continue to be used, um, the research continues and what we're learning from patients continues. And so some of the things that we've learned over the last 10 years since CAR T cells have come um, more into the clinical space is that 
cytokine release syndrome severity or, or how severe a patient experiences this side effect really depends on patient and also the CAR T cell characteristics. And so we have already mentioned that patients that have higher tumor burden um, and also patients that receive more CAR T cells have an increased risk of developing more severe cytokine release syndrome. We also know that some products may have increased risk of cytokine release syndrome or increased severity of cytokine release syndrome. And that timing of CRS really varies depending on patients and what CAR T cell that they receive. But typically, these side effects happen within the first two weeks after infusion. So the symptoms of cytokine release syndrome vary. I think that's important to know. And not all patients will get every symptom. And so we really monitor patients really closely, like I said, in the first month, um, and look to see what types of symptoms patients are having. And then we grade them based on how severe the symptoms are. So do you have low blood pressure? And is that blood pressure low enough that you are needing extra IV fluids? Is that blood pressure low enough that you need extra IV fluids plus blood pressure support with a medicine that would be needed in the ICU? So these are the types of things that we watch for. And again, I think it's important to note that um, we do know that there are you know, some characteristics that we can say may increase your chance of having more severe symptoms, um, but we are still learning So the way that we look at how severe cytokine release syndrome is, um, there's been new grading establishments that have come out over the last few years so that everybody grades cytokine release syndrome the same. Grade one is the most mild type of cytokine release syndrome that is represented by fever only. Grade two cytokine release syndrome is represented by fever plus either low blood pressures and or low oxygen saturations. And then we define severe cytokine release syndrome as either grade three or four, and that is fever with need for blood pressure supportive medications or extra oxygen support that needs ICU level care. Typically, the first line treatment for cytokine release syndrome is supportive care, meaning we will give patients fluids, we will give them Tylenol to help try to control the fevers and any other um, supplementation that they may need. And then if patients start to get more severe cytokine release syndrome or increase in the grade, we can look at anti-cytokine therapy or a medication that could help um, try to reduce some of the inflammation in the body called tocilizumab, which is FDA approved for the treatment of CRS. We usually typically reserve steroids um, for more severe cases of CRS. And generally, cytokine release syndrome is reversible with little long-term toxicity noted, although we are still collecting data. The other side effect that I think is important to talk about today is neurotoxicity or the neurologic side effects that can come from CAR T cell therapy. This has been termed ICANS or immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome. It is considered one of the most severe side effects and has a black box warning for CAR T cell therapy. And there have been varying rates of neurotoxicity across the trials that have been done looking at CAR T cells, ranging anywhere from 30% of patients having some neurologic side effects all the way up to 87% of patients who receive CAR T cells. And there are multiple reasons why neurotoxicity occurs, including cytokines or those inflammatory agents that your body produces. Patients can have a breakdown or a disruption in the blood-brain barrier. Our brain is protected by a specific barrier and so that it continues to be um, protected against invaders of your immune system or infections that can occur throughout your body. 
And so sometimes during the CAR T-cell process, um, due to reasons that are still being evaluated in a research setting, that blood-brain barrier can be disrupted, making it easier for some of the cytokines to uh, you know, go into your um, neurologic system and create inflammation there. And then there are some, you know, more recent studies that have demonstrated or showed that some of the targets for CAR T cells can also be found on nerve cells or in the brain. And so the CAR T cells, if they're targeting a protein like CD19, could potentially bind to whatever, what other cells have CD19 and um, create um, the side effects from that. So some of the symptoms of neurotoxicity include confusion, difficulty writing, speaking, or following commands, and some of the more severe symptoms of neurologic side effects that could occur in up to 30% of patients include seizures, encephalopathy or an altered mental status, or brain swelling. Typically, neurotoxicity is seen after cytokine release syndrome, although patients have a wide presentation variability and the length of the duration of their symptoms differs dramatically. So we use frequent assessments, including daily exams, and standardized questions to ask patients uh, before they get CAR T cells and after they get CAR T cells. Um, and for adults, this includes five questions and a handwriting sample, and the adult questionnaire is um, put up on the screen for you to read. Um, and then for pediatric patients uh, less than 12 years of age, we do an observational assessment between the physicians and the nursing staff um, looking at the patient over a course of time to see whether or not we know how um, these patients um, are responding to their, pa to their family members that are in the room or the nursing staff. And then depending on what a patient's symptoms are, we will look to see whether or not they need additional workup, which could include imaging of the brain using CTs or MRIs, doing a spinal tap, or if they have symptoms that we're concerned for seizure activity, we would put on um, a seizure EEG. So like cytokine release syndrome, we look at um, neurotoxicity and we grade it. So patients with minimal symptoms um, would be graded a grade one. Those with moderate symptoms would be a grade two. And those with more severe symptoms that need intensive care unit care would be grade three or four. And those include seizures, brain swelling, or weakness or difficulty moving their limbs. The first line treatment for neurotoxicity is supportive care, where we increase the frequency of assessments. We may consider adding anti-seizure medications on. And then for patients that develop more severe cases, um, we would consider giving steroids for the treatment of neurotoxicity. There are several ongoing studies looking at if we can use anti-cytokine therapy and or spinal taps administering chemotherapy and steroids into the spinal fluid. Neurotoxicity is generally reversible. However, with just like CRS, we don't really know what long-term effects uh, patients may have from this. Um, and then moving along to uh, other areas that CAR T cells could affect. So it could lower a patient's blood counts. So you can have low blood counts, including platelets, neutrophils, or red blood cells after CAR therapy for a couple of reasons. One, due to the chemotherapy that was received to get your body prepared for the CARs. And two, it could be also due to CAR T cell induced inflammation. Most patients generally cover from having low blood counts within 30 days after the infusion. Um, and we do supportive care measures to help patients um, until they start to make cells on their own including transfusions and uh, GCSF, which is a stimulation to help your white blood cells mature more quickly. Um, and then we have noted that some risk factors that are associated with patients having um, low blood counts for more than three months could include that you have a baseline low blood count to start, 
if you have severe cytokine release syndrome, and how many prior lines of therapy you have received. Uh, infections in CAR are also one of the side effects that we look for, and so CAR therapy is often administered in highly immunocompromised patients. We give the chemotherapy before, which can contribute to the risk of infection, and we know that infections can occur both early in the less than 30 days infusion, um, and they also can occur over the 30-day um, time point. And so in general, patients receive um, prophylaxis medications or medications that could reduce the risk of infection for viruses, um, fungal infections, and bacterial infections. And then for patients with either ALL or lymphoma, because of the target that we use for the CAR, um, your healthy cells can also be decreased. And so there is um, a medication or a transfusion called IVIG that may be administered for at least three months in the post-CAR T-cell infusion time period. So there are potential risks of long-term infectious complications, um, and it, it really depends on institutions in terms of how long they keep these medications on. Um, and then also, when do we vaccinate patients after the CAR T-cells have been performed um, is also institution-specific. Another area that we're looking into is the quality of life of patients after they receive CAR T-cell therapy. Um, and what we know is that patients experience a decline in their quality of life and an increase in symptom burden that's correlated with cytokine release syndrome. And so CAR T-cell patients um, had, in one study, less decline in their quality of life, physical and functional well-being when they were compared to patients who received bone marrow transplant. And in the pediatric setting, we have been able to look at this, and um, one of the studies that was published a few years ago demonstrated that pediatric patients had improvements um, over the three to 12 month time point after CAR in their emotional health, social functioning, school functioning, physical functioning, and in their psychosocial health. And so these are just some of the um, things that we need to consider when looking at some of the late effects of CAR T cells. So how does this psychosocially affect patients? What are the toxicities of other organs? You know, can we improve survival in these patients? Um, what are the neurologic side effects? And how do patients recover their immune system post-CAR? And so, you know, this is just a slide looking at whether we think CARS will be the answer for ALL. And there are several exciting things in this, um, you know, upfront treatment setting um, in CAR T cells, but there's a lot of work to do. So some patients have CAR product failure, so we can't make enough CAR T cells for these patients. Um, their cells don't expand. Or even after CAR T cells, they can have relapse. They can have severe side effects from the CARs. And then, of course, there are several other areas um, of disease that are unmet needs and that need more patients, um, more treatment options for these patients. So for future directions, um, you know, looking at more con CAR T cell constructs, so newer targets that we can do for other disease subtypes, uh, trying to optimize the CAR T cells that we already have in clinic, reducing the side effect profile, monitoring for long-term outcomes, and improving access are all areas of future direction. I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I think it is time to um, start the Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Shalabi, for this excellent and informative presentation. We will now begin the Q&A session. If you have a question for Dr. Shalabi, please use the chat box on the left side of the screen to submit your question. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Our first question is, how long will the patient's immune system be compromised following a CAR T cell therapy? This is an excellent question. I think in general, we have um, 
pretty strict guidelines in terms of the, the types of um, agents or prophylaxis medications that patients have for at least three months after CAR T cells. Um, and really, it is patient-specific um, after that. So most institutions will have you on some type of antiviral, antifungal, and potentially even an antibacterial drug um, for three months. Um, but it all depends on your blood counts. So your immune system can be low for several months after um, based on, um, again, what your counts were going into CAR. Um, but in general, this gets monitored very closely for the first three months post-CAR infusion. I would say, though, that the, you know, the majority of patients um, in terms of infection risk, most infections do occur within the first 30 days of CAR therapy. What are some suggestions in patient care once we are home with our daughter after CAR T cell therapy? Is there anything we should be looking for once she's home and not in the hospital? I think some of the things that can be monitored for are almost standard to uh, patients that have leukemia. And so these are things like, you know, how, what her temperature is, how she is responding. In, most cases, within the first month, where all of the toxicities you know, are, are more thought to occur or the acute toxicities are thought to occur, you would stay more close to campus um, or the hospital that you are receiving the cells at. But some of the signs that I would watch for when we send our patients out are you know, fatigue. Are they tired? Are they more tired? Do they have temperature? Do they have any signs or symptoms of illness, like runny nose, cough? Um, congestion? Um, do they have any bleeding symptoms? So in general, I would say that the care in the post-CAR T cell phase is pretty similar to what you would look for after chemotherapy um, with the inclusion or addition of watching for you know, specific signs of um, neurologic side effects as well. What else is in the media? besides CAR T cells and T cells? What helps the CAR T cells grow? So CAR T cells are um, you know, grown in the lab and they administer different cytokines or different nutrients for those T cells to grow. Um, and so depending on the actual uh, product that you're receiving, those cytokines um, differ. And these are normal like cytokines that would be found in our own body to help our bodies make and produce and help our T cells uh, continue to grow. Um, but the, of course, because the cells are now um, outside of your body, they need those same nutrients or cytokines to grow. So the, the different types of cytokines would be what are added to continue to keep them healthy and happy and to, uh, to grow or expand. I have one more bag of my stem cells left from an initial collection from 2014. Can that bag of cells be used for CAR T cell therapy? I think it depends on um, which stem cells there are. If they are donor stem cells um, and there has not been an interval transplant, it is possible to consider that. Um, but CAR T cells are made from actual T cells, and so there may not be enough T cells in that stem cell product because if you think um, back to the, um, the way that the blood cells are made, so if this is an actual um, stem cell product from a transplant, those baby stem cells may not have already matured into these T lymphocytes that you need to create the CAR T cell product. Um, and so if that is what um, the question is referring to, I don't think that you would be able to use that bag of stem cells um, as a CAR T cell product. But if these are T cells that have been collected for making a CAR product in the past, then yes, there would be potential to use those if they've been um, cryopreserved or frozen down um, appropriately and there has not been a, a transplant that has happened in between the initial CAR T cell product and a potential next CAR T cell product. 
for how long is CAR T cell therapy effective? This is a great question, and I think one that is very patient specific. Um, it can be curative in in some patients. I think the data that's coming out in the pediatric um, experience using uh, tisagen leclusol is that long term, if patients are in remission at that one year mark, it is starting to unfold that those patients will likely, you know, have continued remissions at the three and five year time point. Um, but there are a substantial number of patients in that first year that relapse and we're just not really great at predicting which patients are going to have prolonged remissions and actually have cure from CAR um, at this point, although we are working very hard to try to determine, you know, what are some of the things that we can look at to see whether or not patients are going to have these durable remissions or CAR T cells be the cure. So unfortunately, I don't have a great, um, you know, answer to say that this is how it's going to be for all patients because we're still learning. Um, but what we do know now that we've had um, this FDA approval for uh, the pediatric CAR since 2017 is that, you know, if a patient is in remission for a year, the, the odds are in their favor that they will continue to be in a remission longer term. This is another question on the CAR T cell therapy success. Um, how successful is this therapy and will it become available on a large scale soon? Um, you know, I have a lot of hope in CAR T cell therapy. Um, 10 years ago, we really did not have a, a good treatment repertoire for our patients, or we didn't have a lot of cards to play in terms of what therapies we could offer outside of chemo. And this has really reignited our field to do more and to continue to push the envelope um, to develop more therapies. So I, I do hope that, um, one, this is here to stay because I think the remission rates are very remarkable in this population. And two, um, you know, I do hope that it gets to a really large scale. It is being scaled up. Um, the fact that there are two FDA-approved products for B-cell ALL really bodes well, but as everybody listening to this um, webinar knows, that is not enough. And so we continue to push, um, you know, the manufacturers, the pharmaceutical companies to invest in these platforms so that we can make CAR T cells for more patients. It's a very, um, you know, arduous process. It's a very difficult process to make CAR T cells. There are several steps and um, and so I do hope that this continues to be at the forefront of, you know, how these, you know, pharmaceutical companies and, you know, Congress and anybody who has um, a hand in the manufacturing of these products looks um, so that we can get these products more accessible because accessibility is really a challenge at this point. So not everybody that needs CAR T cells can get them. Um, and I think that that is something that we as doctors are really trying to move you know, the needle on to say that if a patient is able to get this therapy and it's FDA approved, we should make it available to all patients. Is an enlarged spleen a side effect of CAR T cell infusion? Have it, has it been observed in trials? And is it an example of a relapse? Should I be worried? So, you know, leukemia can originate, it usually originates from these stem cells and from places where you make blood. And the spleen is an area by which um, you can have sort of blood cells made um, outside of the bone marrow um, space. And so it's conceivable that CAR T cells um, have gone to that area if there was disease present there before. Um, I would say that if this is a new finding on imaging, um, it would have to be monitored closely for other signs of, of leukemia or relapse. Um, but it's really hard to, to know in specific in this case um, without knowing the background and whether the spleen was enlarged before. Okay. 
here's a question. For, it's more for adult patients, but maybe let's see what you think, if, if you can answer this one. Do you see CAR T cell for adult patients more as alternative to BMT or as a conduit to it? Yeah, I think this is a great question, and this is a question um, sort of across the field in general, pediatrics and adults, um, is, you know, are CAR T cells curative and should they be standalone therapy or are they supposed to be a conduit or should they be a conduit to a stem cell transplant? And my honest answer to this is if you ask, you know, 10 different doctors, they're going to give you 10 different answers. And it really depends on um, the treatment center that you're getting the CAR T cells at um, and whether or not, you know, a patient has had a previous transplant. So in my experience, you know, when we have our, our pediatric patients, um, and they have not received a transplant and they come to us for CAR T cells, we would strongly suggest that if they were to, you know, get into a remission, that they should consider a transplant because we have decades worth experience of transplants and outcomes from transplants as opposed to only 10 years of outcomes in CAR T cell therapy. The other um, sort of caveat to my answer is that it also depends on what type of CAR T cell you are receiving. So depending on the way the CAR T cell is constructed, they may be present um, for a long period of time, CAR T cells in your blood and in your body in circulation. So the persistence may be there. Um, or the CAR T cells may be manufactured in a way that um, the persistence could potentially be shorter. And so those are the types of things that would need to be discussed to determine whether or not, you know, transplant um, as a consolidation after CAR would be indicated. And I will say that, you know, we have tried to look at it in the adult and in the pediatric space for patients that have received CAR, and then if they didn't go to transplant or if they did go to transplant and what outcomes were and unfortunately, we don't have a clear answer because some studies show that transplant offers a better survival advantage. And then other studies looking at other CAR T cell products show that transplant doesn't offer a survival advantage and patients have an overall survival or an overall event-free survival um, that is equivocal or the same to, to patients that have just received CAR T cells. And so I think it's an excellent question and one you know, that the hope when CAR T cells was developed that this would be a standalone therapy, um, but in practice, I think it depends on a number of things, uh, including whether patients have had prior transplant or not, and then what type of CAR T cell did the patient receive. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. In your practice, can you briefly describe any differences between the product Yascarta and Chimera? Yeah, so um, yes, CARTA is, um, is a CD19-directed CAR that um, generally is thought to have shorter persistence, meaning it stays in the body um, less. And then Kimraya is the FDA-approved product in pediatric BALL um, that it is thought to have a, a more prolonged persistence in the body and in the blood. Um, yes, CARTA is not FDA approved for BALL. It is FDA approved in the lymphoma space. And so in lymphomas, it can have a prolonged remission um, rate, but it is not FDA approved um, in adults with BALL at this time. Okay, on behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Sh Dr. Shalabi for a very helpful and informative presentation. And thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way and enjoy the rest of this symposium this week.